Hello everybody, very very good evening to all of you. Welcome back to the three-day China and the Maritime Silk Road Symposium webinar. Once again, my name is Lester Liu. Happy to meet all of you again. Uh, so just a gentle reminder before we begin that our speakers today will be presenting in both English and Mandarin. So do remember to toggle the language interpretation icon whenever necessary uh, to your preferred language. So ladies and gentlemen, our final panel. Uh, well, all good things come to an end, but of course not before we go into this very exciting topic. The topic, Capacity Development in Asian Archaeology, Challenges and Opportunities. The panel will discuss the latest issues, challenges and opportunities regarding the development and capacity building of heritage professionals, specifically in the field of archaeology in an Asian context. Our panel chair for this session is Mr. Yo Kirk Xiang. Mr. Yo is the director of the Heritage Research and Assessment Division at the National Heritage Board Singapore. He's also the coordinator of the Our SG Heritage Plan, which outlines the broad strategies for Singapore's heritage sector from 2018 to 2022. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hand the time over to our panel chair to introduce our speakers for this panel. Please welcome Mr. Yo Kirk Xiang. Mr. Yo, please. Thank you, Lester. Uh, good day to all of you. Thank you for joining us at the last panel discussion of the China and the Marine Time Silk Road webinar. It has been a very enriching discussion over the last few days. We started with a keynote speech by Dr. Tenzin Sen, and he's sharing on the concept of floating cosmopolitanism. And across the different panel discussions, the rich research by our different speakers have brought us on a journey across history, across continents and across oceans, touching on different shipwrecks, cargoes, historical communities, as well as the historical links that link different communities and regions together. Our last panel discussion today on the capacity development in Asian archaeology will highlight many issues that we face in recent times and offer us some ideas and discussion on the way going forward. I think this topic is very appropriate in today's context and it's very uh, suitable topic for us to bring together a wonderful uh, webinar. Um, and especially so given today that the con uh, challenges that COVID-19 poses to much of our work. And our panel speakers today uh, will touch on many contemporary issues including including policy, legal, tourism, uh, and various capacity building initiatives. So for the Q&A, just some housekeeping rules. For the Q&A, can I request that uh, participants please keep your answers short and concise and indicate uh, which institution you are from. And if you are directing the question at a specific speaker, do mention it uh, in the Q&A in the uh, section. So let me now introduce our first speaker of the panel, Mr. Lin Chen Xian, who will be presenting on the topic of challenges in Singapore archaeology. Mr. Lin is an associate fellow at the archaeology unit, the Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. He is a historical archaeologist interested in the transitional period between pre and post European contact in Southeast Asia and the development of port settlements, military fortifications, and the material culture of trade. He has been involved in Singapore archaeology since 2002, and as of 2006, he has led archaeology investigations in Singapore and works extensively on lobbying for legislative changes pertaining to impact assessment, the protection of archaeology sites, and artifact ownership. And without further ado, I would like to hand over the time to Chen. Chen, please, over to you. All right, thank you for the introduction, Kirk Xiang. I hope everyone can hear me. And good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon to wherever you are. For all, uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us, uh, at least for me, this evening. Well, many thanks to friends and colleagues of the Asian Civilizations Museum and National Heritage Board for inviting me. Uh, I actually have very little choice in my topic and presentation, for the title was in part already concocted and assigned to me. My first reaction, well, surely they must have already heard me thousands of times. 
they must already have been converted by now to the Church of Archaeology. It's a wonderful church, right? And since I've been decrying and lobbying everyone for the last two decades. So obviously they don't need me to preach to them again. Well, I take comfort, I guess, in the belief that there must remain some people wishing for me to propagate uh, my past reiterations. So anyhow, let me begin my presentation with a brief history and background of archaeology in Singapore. Since the arrival of the East India Company, uh, antiquarian curiosity by these company officials and early merchants took an active interest with this, uh, their new surroundings. Men like Raffles, Crawford, and others provide, us some, provide some of the first records about the archaeological remains found in Singapore. The rise of scientific institutions uh, such as the Botanic Gardens and the Raffles Museum in the late 19th century um, brought about more learned men uh, who started exploring the antiquity of the region. Unfortunately, there are men. I haven't found any records about women yet, but there must have been some. However, all this focus by the museums and the gardens were primarily on prehistory with stone tools, shell middens, early habitations and such. Uh, we do have these pioneers to thank for, for their work and the records, but interest was essentially driven by Europeans and in inevitably they're Eurocentric in outlook and affected by prevalent social political uh, conditions in the home countries. Unfortunately, due to the dearth of accounts, we do not know what are the local or Asian population's impression on any archaeological remains and finds. Well, intriguingly, despite the golden age of Malayan archaeology in the 1930s and 1960s organized under the Raffles Museum in Singapore, there are strangely no investigations uh, into the pre-colonial, pre-modern Singapore uh, island itself. It's only in 1984, which is quite recent, uh, where systematic uh, archaeology was initiated in Fort Canning. Since then, the discipline has uh, steadily entrenched itself and evolved into a hybrid type of development-led uh, archaeological excavations that we see today. So what are the issues that we face as archaeologists, at least in Singapore? Well, not arranged in uh, any particular order of uh, criticality or importance, I do pen down some of my thoughts uh, here and some of the principal challenges experienced by myself and my colleagues over the last two decades. Uh, government interest and support, I guess it goes without saying. <laughs> uh, I have frequently stated and argued that archaeology is a public good and archaeologists serve as custodians of Singapore's past and identity. Hence, government interest and ownership in the discipline is healthy, essential, and crucial. The challenge is to ensure that the discipline remains relevant and obtain necessary support and funding from these uh, government agencies. Early archaeology in Singapore was essentially funded by private foundations and also research money from universities. Incidentally, uh, I mentioned previously about the Raffles Museum, uh, their early archaeology was funded privately by the uh, uh, the Carnegie Foundation from New York. While private funding are still significant contributors, since 2012 with the creation of uh, uh, Mr. Yeo's unit of the, the Heritage Research and Assessment Division in NHB, there has been an obvious uptick in funding and support. Today, NHB is the principal sponsor for most archaeological work in, in the country. Well, another challenge which I think is high on the list, at least for me, is the nature of development-led uh, rescue excavations. Rescue excavations are the final opportunity to salvage the data and finds from well, development. However, restricted windows to excavate and limited resources committed resulted in many lost opportunities. The excavations in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, archaeologists were overwhelmed by just the sheer size of the construction site and never had the resources or perhaps even inclination to comprehensively investigate the land and could only sample a fraction of the site. Until today, not a single um, excavation site in Singapore resulted in the complete excavation and rescue of the archaeological reservoir. A critical example was the Empress Place site, where approximately 40% of the site were with proven archaeological uh, remains was destroyed by development back in 2015. Could we have avoided this destruction and loss? 
Indisputably, yes, we could avoid them. Several excavations such as the National Gallery Singapore, the Victoria Concert Hall and Southern Gate sites have demonstrated that it is possible with adequate planning uh, and resources to someday in the future, we might be able to completely mitigate an entire site. Well, to date, every archeologist working in Singapore are essentially affiliated with academic institutions. However, their roles in the field and managing the archeological archives frequently intersect with development and heritage agencies. Inevitably, the, the role in the field and uh, um, are, we are drawn into policy uh, needs and debates. For example, issues relating to heritage impact assessments, ownership of artifacts and custodianship of, of collections, who design and determine these policies, archeologists or government officials? This is a complicated by the fur further by the calling the same number of archaeologists who's working, putting on different hats. Practicing Singaporean archaeologists essentially perform multiple roles of academic researcher or teacher, lecturer, contract field worker, laboratory analysis, archivist and collections manager, as well as a public educator and activist. So each one of these subfields actually presents a different diverse set of policy determinants. One major issue which I face, or at least our, our, our profession here, the training of archaeologists is a heavy and time sensitive uh, investment. The latter equates with the latter level of experience of building up a specialist knowledge uh, in artifact identification and analysis. Many in the audience will probably have heard me speak on this before. <laughs> I shall reiterate again, if you mind, that archaeologists in Singapore are overwhelmed by the myriad of responsibilities from the number of projects and the enormous backlog of artifacts awaiting processing. The most critical and immense challenge with building local personnel capacity is the unstable nature of employment and generally low wages vis-a-vis -vis with other professions with the same education background. It is actually economically more lucrative to be a policeman, school teacher, postman, or any other Singaporean civil servant compared to an archaeologist. Well, I mentioned that we have enormous amount of material that we're processing. This carries over from our previous challenge. The few available archaeologists tackling an imbalanced number of development-led rescue excavations, university teachings, and other responsibilities. This result with research analysis of the finds frequently taking a back seat and publication slow in production. Over the years, archaeologists have stockpiled a significant amount of finds. I've written about this elsewhere and should not dwell too much into this and instead summarize the Perino issue with a cautiously optimistic note. In the recent two years, the National Heritage Board, uh, together with the Tomasic Foundation, have devoted funding for the processing, cataloging, and upkeep of finds, providing essential lifelines for the immediate future. While generous these fundings may be, there still remain the long-term outlook. As we have yet to look uh, beyond the next few years and into perhaps the next generation. As a social science, archaeology in Singapore is entrenched within the cultural historical model and has yet to explore other subfields, such as studying the historical environment, landscape, or maritime seascapes. There are many opportunities to embark on a multidisciplinary interpretation of a site and its finds. I alluded to this earlier. A few archaeological investigations in Singapore are largely driven by the necessity of rescuing the finds and data, rather than structured as a research project. What do I mean? Well, development-led archaeology gives us few opportunities to design and test a targeted hypothesis. For example, what was the environment like in the 1300s? What was food grown and consumed? How much of the landscape was modified by the settlement and inhabitants? These are but a few examples of queries in exploring and testing of research methods and theories. Over the past three decades, historians studying Singapore are unanimous on the contribution of archeology span 
to the understanding of pre-modern Singapore, especially during the medieval Tomasic period between the 14th and 17th century AD. Yet colonial and more contemporary periods such as post-independence, uh, archaeology is underdeveloped. We already know much from the lens of history, so what more can an artifact or the site tell, uh, site tell us? How can archaeology provide an alternative or addition or additional dimension to the past, despite well-recorded big history? What else can be said of a site from an archaeological perspective, be it humanizing the forgotten and unnamed subaltern? Some traction has been made in this area in interpreting the sites and events through the archaeological lens, such as on Fort, uh, Fort uh, Sarapong on Blakamanti Iron, a 19th century uh, to World War II fortification, but such investigations are few and far between. The use of archaeology in the age of words, historical archaeology, is a subfield of broader church. And this subset paths often crosses with that of historians. I have gathered here several non-scientific definitions from fellow historical archaeologists or post-medieval archaeologists as is known in the UK, which provides a rather tongue-in-cheek view of our discipline vis-a-vis -vis history. Clearly, both historians and archaeologists are brothers and sisters in arms, and we really need to do more to work with each other. An archaeological site report is painfully descriptive and empirical, and believe me, and it's really already a challenge to tease out a nun's data about uh, past life ways from the site. Beyond relevance to a specific site, how can we plug Singapore archaeology into the broader region's past? Since the 2000s, historians such as uh, Kwa Chong Guan, Peter Boschberg, Derek Heng have been making inroads in planting Singapore in the larger regional uh, history or histories, particularly the island's strategic geographical, uh, geographical position and role in maritime trade and regional political tug of war. But what are the comparable archaeological data that can be used to examine rival trading port settlements in the region or beyond? As of now, archaeological data remain descriptive and piecemeal. Many opportunities remain for utilizing such data on a broader perspective. So in conclusion, 35 years has lapsed since the beginning of systematic archaeology in Singapore. While the past three decades were pioneering ones for the handful of archaeologists who persevered, many of the challenges from inception remains. We still have much work ahead Archaeology is about the study of time of times past, and archaeologists have a very long horizontal a horizon in outlook. Hence, the long road to overcoming these challenges are perhaps part of a symptomatic makeup of our discipline. I remain perhaps naively and hopelessly optimistic. Surely and steadily, these challenges are being surmounted and slowly chipped away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen, for the candid and very concise sharing of the challenges that you are facing archaeologists in Singapore. So our next speaker is uh, Ms. Zainab Tahir. She'll be presenting on the topic of can locally managed tourism help in the protection of historic shipwrecks? Ms. Zainab graduated from the Hassanuddin University in South Sulawesi, majoring in archaeology and the School of Earth and Environmental Science, James Cook University, Australia, focusing on marine protected area management. She worked as a heritage analyst for the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, and her current position is the head of section for the Shipwrecks Management Unit. Her major responsibilities include conducting assessments on underwater site management and overseeing collections and supervising the operational activities of the Marine Heritage Gallery under the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Ms. Zainab, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeo. Good evening, morning and afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I hope all of us here are always in a good shape within this global pandemic. 
Uh, thanks to Steven and the ACM team for the effort making these panels onto the stage with larger audience, for sure. I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, now, I would like to share our three years experience dealing with, uh, if I might call this human dimension in heritage management, on how to manage historic wreck and object in conjunction with local-based marine ecotourism in one small coastal village in Karawang, West Java. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is the map of the area. Uh, there are four dots plotting the village to the three underwater sites. And next, please. I will come up first with the potentials uh, before we get into the issues. When we have started in 2017 for, for underwater archaeological survey, we underlined three things, three significances from the area and its surroundings. Of course, the historical findings. Um, the literature mentioned that Karawang, Karawang is part of the petrol areas of VOC troops in, 90, in 18th uh, century and also the local hub for communities transferred during the colonial time. Uh, Karawang, known as a border area between the VOC and Mataram. And even long before uh, the Portuguese record mentioned the port in Northern Java Sea, in West Java, the Caravam. And for the material objects, we found POC coins along the coast, uh, one larger anchor, five cannons underwater. Uh, the fishermen say it is nine, actually. They sold it too. Um, and on this side, based on our sonar and subatom profile projection, uh, it is probably very high likely uh, more than one shipwreck buried in one uh, in one side. Uh, the place has historical identity. Next, please. And the second, the second significance that we found is. Um, the richness of biodiversity, the important coastal ecosystem, quite huge area uh, area of mangroves as a habitat for for ah oh, this is the this is the the findings the coins and as you can see, um, large anchor at the left bottom side and um, and um, and the cannon and next please. And another region, uh, the, the richness of biodiversity, the importance of coastal ecosystem, quite huge area of mangrove as a habitat of coastal bird. And also the coverage of um, the coverage of uh, coral reefs, so around 4,000 4, 4, 4, hectares coral reef coverage. Um, and this is quite uncommon in the northern coast of Java. The quality of northern Java sea water is quite poor due to the due to the uh, a high sedimentation and also the coral reef cover uh, highly damaged uh, due to the irresponsible fishing activities. But in some spots in the area, we found a quite large uh, coral reef coverage, and uh, and the important thing we have found them. A local people, a local people that we call local champion, they're willing to change and manage the and manage the resources. Next, please. Along with the significances, we found the main the main challenges. 60% of the residents of the people lives in the poor condition in the area. 
And besides as a fisherman, in 1990s, in 1990s, hunting for historical objects is common for them to get additional income. Sadly, few death unrecorded and unreported cases happen, mostly due to the unhealthy diving method when they have in, when they involve in the searching or joint treasure hunting. And another, another issues, slum, river area, marine debris issues and drop. Next please. After our first survey, they, we realized if we decide to follow up the survey into the, into the management level, we will not deal with heritage management only, but also with social and economic and even the ecological issues. Uh, this slide, this slide shows that what we have done since 2017, as you might see in the first year of intervention, we conducted community, cons uh, community consultation, um, resource mapping, a scientific survey, uh, surely archaeological, oceanography, and ecosystem around the wreck. Uh, I think Ms. Niane Hasana is in here. We are collaborating with the Marine Research Center for, uh, for the survey, for the scientific survey. And also, we start to build partnership with the university first as we realize that we can't do this alone with the complexities of with the complexities of issue and in the second year 2018 we continue the survey we will continue the survey with a show sites can sonar and site assessment for artifacts movement uh, and and sub bottom profiler just to get the perspective of the site the uh, and, and we found that in one area, very highly, um, highly likely that uh, more than one wrecks be buried under the, under, under, under the site. But, um, however, it, it is covered in a massive coral reefs. So um, we consider this if we, if we do, if we conduct a disturbance, uh, dis disturbance research, then uh, the consequences are the, cons the consequences are we we need to to break the um, the, the 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 massive coral, which is um, uh, this is quite high uh, high biodiversity in there, and and. Um, after and also in the second year we 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 start the capacity building if you might realize that i mentioned uh unhealthy diving method mostly the fish mostly fishermen there are using a hookah uh, system that when they dive whether they search for uh, for 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 they, they they look for them what do we call it um for fishing and then um, and also dive for 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 that searching historical objects, and so we introduce them. We try to introduce them the scuba gear. It is not uh, they know the scuba gear, but they 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 don't they they are not used to uh, uh, to use it for for uh, for activities in them. Uh, for, for their marine activities, and 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 also we we embed the very basic recording when they on historical sites, um, and another activity is a small scale entrepreneurship. When we think about tourism, then um, that we need it is we need to we need to introduce that. Uh, this is part, this is part of a, there is a business that we can, uh, economic side, and then business that we try to build, tourism activities, tourism attractions, and uh, it is, it offers services to the, uh, services to the, uh, to the visitors, 
and and also uh, we expand we expand the partnership we expand the partnership and and build the interpretation facilities as they can use as a gallery we hope that we hope uh, we expect that uh, during the community our community our second community consultation we expect what they have found uh, on the field they can they're willing to display on the on, on that small gallery along with the interpretation uh, interpretation uh, for sure and uh in the second year we wanted to ensure the heritage management embedded into the local government tourism plan uh, as we think how oh, we think how to how to make this um, how to make this program uh, sustainable sustainable and uh, therefore we, we 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 come up with the idea the, the management the management program the heritage management program need to be included in the government in the local government tourism plan and uh, in 2019 uh, the intervention that we we've done is um, like a small scale business scale up to cater uh, to cater to cater visitor as they as they have started to uh, to get an attention from the community surroundings and uh, another capacity building for entrepreneurship and and also another facility subsidy like boat and a diving gear uh, diving gear for uh, for to build an attraction and to scale up uh, to scale up the 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 tourism activities in there um, and the interesting thing is um, the local villagers the local villagers willing to 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 put a village regulation for tourism to manage the tourism inside them uh, inside their village so in a, in this um, in the second year the village regulation issued uh, in indonesia we call it peraturan desa and the local government and the local government agreed to build museum to this to display a museum or the large museum in the uh, at the city, in the city to display what local people uh, to to display what local people found give a chance to to display what local people found sorry uh, next please uh, for the uh, for for this year program is quite slow moving due to the due to the pandemic um, the program is still actually the program is still continue with um uh, we expand into the um, how how to connect how to connect the, the this local based tourism into the other area into the surroundings uh, to, to the surroundings village to, yeah to, to the surroundings village to scale up to scale up the to scale up the the program and during our community discussion for management plan we presented this flowchart to bring the idea that biodiversity and heritage have function in the life of the community in their life is they okay with the sound yes okay please carry on thank you okay yeah, we can still you. hear you um, for biodiversity for biodiversity function we got from the uh, our resource our resource mapping and uh, we try that we try to identify that from the resource mapping we found the coral reefs cover mangroves uh, mangroves ecosystem and we also found that the mangroves reduce 
reduce the abrasion and barrier for the uh, barrier for the marine debris. And uh, and later that it has um, it has the potentials for local attractions uh, for local recreational spot. And the for for coral reefs, uh, it it becomes actually a recreational fishing spot, and um, and for of course for for snorkeling and diving, and as as we I mentioned before that it is quite rare um, the it is quite rare in the northern coast of Java with the uh, with the very poor. Uh, very poor sedimentation in there, so hardly to find a very uh, a good good visibility. But luckily, we found in the some spots for the coral reefs a coverage. Next, please. And this is a heritage function that we've got during the community consultation and resource mapping. Uh, the underwater, the, 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 the objects that we found, it becomes, um, it, it, for sure, it is historical identity for the community. And, and from the place and for, for Karawang itself uh, uh, in general. And there is a short-term economic interest. As they, um, it becomes an additional income for them. But there is a, there is a, Sadly, there are few cases, few cases, few dead cases for improper uh, diving habit during the, the uh, during their involvement in this, and loss of heritage of for sure. If they, as I mentioned, they they, they sell the artifacts for sure. It is it, it is it is a quiet loss. It is a big loss for them. And for the historical identity. There is a potential for interpretation and display the gallery, the small gallery, the village, and the, and the, and the museum. It is attractions, track visitation, and community branding. Uh, next, please. From this flow chart, uh, we would like actually to see when we place those resources, both cultural, historical, and natural, as an asset to the community with immaterial and material value, will it be relevant for targeting conservation and preservation outcomes? Next, please. In the last slide, uh, this is our evaluation question, truly. Uh, the, well, heritage management embedded into the local base marine tourism development targeting perspective. Targeting perspective changes on how they have seen heritage in their areas. Do they aware that this is part of their identity, their uniqueness, lead them to build a sense of belonging to protect? Um, oh, to, pro to protect or to protect and um, to protect and or it is just shifting attention and and for this uh, uh how it is it now uh the museum is local uh, at the local government building established in town and sea tour and snorkeling it is it is um, uh, quite uh, popular and facilities to access mangrove ecosystems also established and more small shops to cater visitor um, available now and the, the visitors three to three hundred to five hundred people a week visit the place and regular village for program for beach and mangroves cleanup next please ah this one uh, this is our evaluation question actually that we when we embed heritage management into local uh, base marine tourism development uh, targeting perspective changes on how they see heritage in their areas. Do they aware of the uh, that this is part of their identity, their uniqueness that lead them to build a sense of belonging to protect, or this is just a shifting attention, the activities. So to close the presentation, we underline two things that uh, local communities are not being taught 
to identify their potentials and way to manage and link it into development strategies. And the second one, the failure of environment and, and the culture and its possible contribution to enhance the quality of life need to be promoted in the language and ecology they can understand. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zaina, for the presentation. It's been very interesting to hear, I think, how heritage, archaeology, nature, biodiversity can all come together, um, you know, together with tourism, together with economics, to look at um, sustainable development of the uh, community. So I think we, during the Q&A, I think maybe these are some of the issues, broad issues that we can discuss further. So let me now move on to the third speaker of our panel. Um, our third speaker today is uh, Dr. Xing Guang Chan. Um, Dr. Xing is currently employed at the National Center of Underwater Cultural Heritage in China. She received her bachelor's and master's degree from the School of Archaeology and Museology at Beijing University in 2005 and 2008 respectively. In 2016, she received a doctorate degree from the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Her main areas of specialization are in Southeast Asia, ceramic archaeology, and underwater archaeology. So for today's presentation, she will be touching on the topic of underwater archaeology in China, a 30-year history. Um, Dr. Singh, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ye. 各位老师、参会人员,晚上好。我是来自中国国家文物局水下文化遗产保护中心的水下考古工作者星光灿。非常感谢ACM亚洲文明馆 Stephen Murphy 博士给我提供这个机会。跟大家分享我所从事专业的历史故事。今天我演讲的题目是 中国水下考古三十年，我将从如下十个方面简单介绍中国水下考古发展的历程：学科缘起、学科成立、机构建设、人才培养、考古实践、重点工程、专用船舶、走向深海、主要成果以及合作交流。那么我希望透过这十个方面呢，让所有国内外的听众既能简单的又能比较全面的了解中国时下考古的历史和现状。相对于西方而言，中国时下考古学科的起步比较晚，可以说起因于一个比较轰动的特殊事件。一九八五年
，中国历史博物馆设立了水下考古学研究室。一九八七年发生的这三件大事，可以视为中国水下考古诞生的三大标志。而余伟超先生呢，是当之无愧的中国水下考古事业的开创者，中国水下考古学科的奠基人。三十年来，中国水下考古机构经历了从无到有、从小到大、从内设到独立建制的演变。因为我们考古机构的经历比较复杂，这里呢，我只讲三个标志性事件。一九八七年十一月，中国历史博物馆在考古部设立了水下考古学研究室，是中国水下考古从无到有的标志。二零零九年九月。中国文化遗产研究院在内部设立了国家水下文化遗产保护中心。二零一五年一月，国家博物馆水下考古研究室整体划转，并入国家文物局水下文化遗产保护中心，也就是我目前工作的单位。它是目前国内唯一一家中国国家级层面管理的水下文化遗产的机构。三十年来，中国水下考古人才的培养也经历了从送出去到请进来，再到独立自主培训的这么一个过程。一九八七年到一九八九年，中国派员分别去荷兰、日本、澳大利亚参加培训。一九九八年以来，我国才开始自主举办水下考古培训班。此后呢，每两到三年左右举办一届。每届培训二十人左右，从而形成了中国独特的培养体系。截止到二零一七年，我国已经培养出水下考古、水下文化遗产保护的各类人才大约两百人。我们举办的培训班种类丰富多样，包括水下考古、出水文物保护以及专题技术和技能的培训等等。基本上已经形成了比较成熟的人才培训体系，而培训的范围呢也在逐步扩大，由单一的潜水技能培训，逐步走向内容多元化、学员多样化的培训。培训工作聚焦在水下考古学研究和水下文化遗产保护这两个比较大的主题方面。二零一三年以来，国家文物局委托水下中心举办了两届高水平培训班，就是我们屏幕上看到的这两张照片。其中，二零一五年培训班是水下中心独立建制以来的首届人才培训。二零一七年的“一带一路”沿线国家水下考古培训班是响应国家“一带一路”的号召进行的人才培训，而我本人呢是参加了二零一七年的“一带一路”水下考古培训班。收获非常巨大。迄今为止，中国水下考古专业人员培训班已经举办了八届，共培训了一百四十五人，而这些人呢，主要来自于中国的沿海各省以及内水发达的省份。在需要实施考古项目的时候，我们会去借调、组织这些队员一起完成任务。另外呢，除了国内的人员，我们培训的外籍学员来自肯尼亚、沙特、伊朗、泰国、柬埔寨等五个亚非国家。我们呢也已经与这些国家的水下考古机构建立了非常良好的关系。三十年来，中国水下考古工作不仅覆盖了中国的四大海域。部分内水水域还走出了国门，考古实践和考古项目的进行也反映了中国考古工作的进步和成长。在这里呢，我只列举比较典型的例子，比如一九九零年福建定海白礁调查项目是中日合作项目，这时的中国呢仍然需要借助外国的力量完成一项工作，而到了一九九二年到一九九七年的辽宁绥中三道港。元代沉船遗址的调查和发掘，呃，则完全是由中国考古队的力量独立完成的。九五到九九年西沙华光礁调查发掘项目，则实现了中国水下考古从近海走向远海的梦想。
二零零一年广东南海一号，二零一零年南澳一号。则是非常具有代表性的对大型沉船遗址的发掘项目。另外，虽然中国水下考古做的最多的是沉船遗址的调查发掘，但绝对不仅仅局限于沉船遗址。我们也有对城市遗址、手工业遗址的调查发掘，就是说，大部分陆地考古调查发掘项目的类型，我们都是可以涵盖到的。比如，二零一一年，湖北丹江口水库军州古城就是一座被淹没的明代城市遗址。修建水库的时候，整个城市全部被掩盖在水面之下，而我们的物探技术呢，可以使用多波束声呐，做到对整个城市面貌的复原。二零一六年，广东省西樵山石岩岩水下采石场，则是一个手工业遗址。这个采石场呢？完全同样的，完全是被淹没的。它的整体构造非常复杂，需要难度最大的洞穴潜水才能完成，对潜水技术的要求是非常高的。二零一三年到二零一六年，我们对辽宁威海致远舰、经远舰进行了调查，这是中国近现代沉船调查和保护的经典案例。呃，大家都知道，中日甲午海战是木质帆船战舰被蒸汽机装甲战舰取代以后的第一次大规模海战。致远舰和经远舰都是铁质战舰，船体呢残损比较严重，呃，有的是完全或者是部分的被海底的泥沙所掩埋，而埋藏的海洋环境呢具备一定的能见度，所以从技术层面上讲。呃，甲午海战沉舰水下考古呢，是中国全新的一个创举。三十年来，中国水下考古与水下文化遗产保护是相辅相成的，整体打捞和原址保护的理念也在不断得到实践和运用。二零零九年，重庆白鹤梁水下博物馆建造完工，呃。比如左边的图片所展示的，观众呢可以在水下四十米的呃参观廊道内欣赏白鹤梁水文石刻。它是世界上第一个真正意义上的水下博物馆，曾经得到联合国教科文组织的特别赞赏。另外一个重大工程呢是南海一号，南海一号沉船呢从意外发现、水下调查。到用沉箱进行整体打捞、室内保护、发掘与展示，前面已经有我的同事、水下考古研究所技术总监孙健老师做了非常精彩的介绍，所以这里呢，具体我就不再展开叙述了。总之，这两个大项目融合了海洋工程、水下考古、保护和展示等等最前沿的科学成果，甚至我们可以说。他们是国际水下文化遗产保护领域的经典案例。接下来，我们谈一谈我们的考古专用船。呃，实际在这个考古专用船建造之前，我们的水下工作很大程度上都是依赖渔船来来完成的。呃，我们建造的第一艘。专用考古船也是目前唯一一艘是中国考古零一号，它是专门用于水下考古调查和发掘的科研型船只。二零一三年在重庆开工建造，二零一四年八月份在青岛交付使用，九月份就首航去辽宁丹东参加致远舰的调查。呃，考古零一号呢是集水下考古、临时保护、现场展示。呃，和后勤保障的一个综合的工作平台，它呢也是中国水下考古装备的一次质的飞跃，使我们成为继法国、韩国之后第三个拥有考古专用船的国家。二零一八年四月份，南海海域深海考古调查突破了中国水下考古发展的技术瓶颈。通过参考国际深海考古发展的经验，经过多年的酝酿， 2 0 1 8年1月，我们和中国科学院深海科学与工程研究所联成立了
，呃，深海考古联合实验室。四月份，我们 G 组队去南海进行调查，呃，用多波束呢扫测了大概三百多平方公里的范围，下潜总共七次。最大下潜深度呢，超过了一千，超过了水下一千米，发现并提取了六件文物标本。我们右侧图片展示的蛟龙号和深海勇士号，就是本次潜水所用的载人潜器。此次深海调查项目的实施呢，是中国载人深潜技术与水下考古的首次联合，它填补了中国深海考古领域的空白。三十年来，中国水下考古的刊物也在不断的推陈出新。呃，我们目前为止出版了很，也同时出版了很多大型的考古报告，将近二十部；论文集十余部，译著将近十部，并且发表了论文，呃，超过一千篇。我们水下考古的科研成果，现在可以说进入了非常丰富的收获时期。近十年来，我们对外合作也不断加强，先后与韩国国立海洋文化财研究所、法国国家水下考古中心、英国国家海事博物馆、沙特国家考古中心等等签订了合作框架协议，增进双方在人才互访、项目合作、资料共享等方面的工作。我们与希腊、伊朗、印度等国家相关机构也正在协商合作事宜。和斯里兰卡、印尼、菲律宾、泰国、越南等海丝沿线国家的相关机构展开了积极的学术交流活动，旨在推动海丝沿线跨国研究与合作。呃，最后呢，我想借这个平台，借此机会，为我们国家文物局水下文化遗产保护中心（英文简称是 NCUCH） 做一个小小的推广宣传。我们呢是隶属于中国文旅部管理的国家文物局。是从科研角度实施水下考古和水下文化遗产保护工作的机构，希望呢将来有机会与更多国家的文博机构、科研院所开展合作，践行 UNESCO 水下文化遗产保护公约的精神，致力于保护全人类共同的物质和精神财富。好，感谢大家，谢谢。Thank you, Dr. Sin, for the wonderful presentation. I think it touches on many issues, including the talent development, the use of technology, the investment in technology to support our underwater archaeology, as well as、um, the international collaboration to enhance、uh, our work in this area. So our next speaker、um, is Dr. Noel Hidalgo Tan. He will be sharing on. The opportunities and challenges in capacity building for underwater cultural heritage in Southeast Asia. Dr. Tan is the senior specialist in archaeology at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts (Simeo Spafa) in Bangkok, Thailand. Noel works across the region and oversees the center's archaeology programs, such as training courses, seminar, and the Spafa Journal. Born in Singapore, he obtained his PhD at the Australian National University and has conducted archaeological fieldwork in Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Myanmar. So, without further ado,、um, Dr. Noel, please. Hello, hi everyone out there.、Um, hi from Bangkok.、Uh, Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, ACM,、uh, for inviting me to give this talk.、Uh, and nice to see、uh, all my friends online,、uh, old friends and new friends.、Um, it is a great pleasure for me to present、uh, something about the challenges and opportunities of safeguarding underwater heritage in Southeast Asia.、Um, and I present this.、Um, uh, On behalf of myself and Senior Spafa, the organization I work for, but also、uh, with some of our colleagues from around the region,、uh, and we will see work from them、uh, in, in a bit.、Um, for my for my presentation, I wanted to give、um, a bit of a historical over. No, 
not so much of a historical overview. I, I think we, we deal a lot with his history a bit, but I, I do want to talk a bit about the past, about how we got here, uh, where we are at now, and uh, what's coming up in the future, what, what uh, seems to be like in the future in the, the next couple of years, at least uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, in the course of this presentation, I, I spoke to many of our colleagues from Thailand, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from the Philippines, and from Vietnam. Uh, and I'm happy to, to share some of their updates with you. Um, so a little bit about um, SPARFA, the organization that I work for. We are, um, we are the most influential organization you've never heard of in archaeology. Um, we are based in Thailand. I think for people in Singapore, if you know the RELC, the Regional English Language Center, um, SPARFA is a, the archaeology equivalent. We are the Regional Archaeology Center. We fall underneath the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education organization. Um, and we are headquartered in Bangkok. So uh, I'm Singaporean, but I, I work, uh, I'm based in Bangkok. And we work uh, primarily with promoting uh, technical competence in archaeology. Uh, not just underwater archaeology, but uh, many, many other forms of archaeology uh, and promoting archaeology in the region. So um, maritime archaeology and underwater archaeology have been one of those really important things uh, that has been um, part of SPAFA's DNA from the very beginning. So uh, as early as 1974, there was a technical cooperation set up for training underwater archaeologists uh, in the 70s. And in fact, uh, many of those trained in the 70s uh, continue to be trainers, uh, continue to train generations of underwater archaeologists in the region today. Um, I'm not going to read through this entire list, but we have had uh, over the decades uh, a number of underwater archaeology courses and we uh, we are involved in teaching uh, basic diving principles of underwater archaeology. And we do this in partnership with uh, organizations in the region, such as the Underwater Archaeology Division in Thailand, with our colleagues in Indonesia, um, with our friends in UNESCO. And we do this fairly regularly uh, because uh, personnel need training um, all, all the time. We do training. Uh, in, in one season, it would be like a, a six-week course in basic diving and basic excavation. And then after that, we would have to do uh, an advanced uh, course after that. Uh, so that takes, that takes time and that takes training for, for a dedicated number of personnel. Uh, over, over the last decade, we've done uh, more trainings uh, and more uh, consultative meetings with um, our partners in the region. Uh, I think the last big trainings, oh no, there, there have been quite a number of trainings in Bangkok, in Vietnam. Um, yes, in Bangkok, no, in Thailand and in Vietnam, um, and in Indonesia. Uh, and SPAFA has been uh, involved in um, either directly or indirectly training personnel for underwater archaeology. So um, as a regional forum for sharing information in archaeology in the region, um, I'm going to bring back to this rather old document now, which is, uh, I just checked, it's published in 1992. You can still download it. Um, it is a consultative workshop on underwater archaeological research. And even though it is 28 years old, uh, a lot of the issues still remain today. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, a few of them. Um, and you'll see that uh, the issues that were pressing then still remain today. Um, Senior Sparta remains a, a, a center point for gathering um, and figuring out where the training needs lies, but also uh, trying to encourage every country to develop an underwater archaeology, archaeology division uh, trying to help members standardize methodology and databases uh, and, and providing means of exchange for uh, member countries. So we've seen um, over the years, um, like say in Thailand, when they organize a underwater archaeology field school, 
uh, they would partner with us and then we would bring um, uh, Southeast Asian participants to join in underwater archaeology training uh, in Thailand and in other parts. So we, we, we do try to encourage um, Southeast Asian participation in local training workshops. Um, when it comes to current regional capacity, really when it comes to an underwater archaeological capacity, you really need three things. Uh, and this is this is my my impromptu model, uh, but it's explanatory. You need number one trained personnel. You need uh, a dedicated department looking after South, uh, looking after uh, underwater uh, maritime heritage, and then you need the resources and equipment to actually conduct um, operations. Um, currently, I think most countries have some sort of personnel. Uh, that have been trained. Uh, one, at least one personnel has been trained. Uh, in Singapore, I know there's one or two. Uh, Brunei has a has a trained diver who works in the, uh, the museum. And whenever they uh, are called to inspect something underwater, they would uh, call this person in the museum to go out into the to the field to to oversee any excavation. Uh, and then you have. Uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Philippines, we have trained personnel and they have a, a dedicated department inside the uh, heritage office or in the government ministry that looks after uh, underwater cultural heritage. Uh, so that's a step up. And then uh, as far as I, as I can see, uh, Indonesia and Thailand has um, all three. They have, um, they have personnel, they have a department. Uh, in Indonesia's case, they have two departments. And they have uh, the capacity to be able to go out for uh, underwater operations on a regular basis. Uh, and, and we will see that uh, upcoming. And so the, 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 uh, the tricky part has always been um, trying to at least establish people who are trained personnel in uh, every region. Um, like say, for example, Lao PDR uh, is a special case. Lao is a, a landlocked country. So their archaeology is either uh, in lakes, which uh, or, or they have they have like submerged cities uh, that, that have been found in the last ten years, or, or either that riverine archaeology uh, and underwater archaeology in, in rivers is a vastly different operation than it is uh, in the open sea, and that takes far more uh, specialized skills than than it does for for uh, open sea operations. Um, in, in Vietnam, in, uh, we know that they've only just established very recently an underwater uh, archaeology division uh, within the Institute of Archaeology in Vietnam's Academy of Social Sciences. And they have been trying, uh, more, they've been more active recently to um, do more archaeological projects uh, in the waters. And, and Vietnam famously uh, uh, says that they have. Uh, several hundred miles of uh, coastline to work with. Um, so in the course of putting this presentation together, I asked uh, uh, our different colleagues from around the region to, to show you the, the, the range of uh, uh, underwater archaeology projects that are going on in the region. Uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, two main uh, organizations working uh, with underwater archaeology. We have Pusat Akanas, which, are the, which is the uh, National uh, Center for Archaeology. Uh, they've done recent work in uh, Lake Matano in uh, Papua. And then we also have uh, um, a maritime, the, the, the Perth Maritime Conservation Area, which uh, Natalie will speak about after me, so I will leave that for her. Uh, but of course, they seem to be best bound for the foreseeable future. For the um, Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, uh, which is what uh, Zainab was part of, uh, they've been doing work uh, in uh, Tidore, in the northern Molokas, to look for uh, Spanish Portuguese shipwrecks. And this is part of the 500 year anniversary of Magellan's circumnavigation of the, of the Earth. Uh, and this year, they've been working in uh, Riau Islands in Batam, just south of Singapore. Um, surveying sites and also conducting um, um, workshops with the locals about what to do when they find uh, sites and to set up 
local community museums. Uh, we do have the Maritime Archaeology, uh, the MAP Fund, the Maritime Archaeology Project Fund, uh, which is uh, established by Professor Mark Stanford from Queen's University. Uh, and with that money, he's been able to uh, fund uh, an Indonesian scholar to, to study um, in Queen's University uh, right now. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, in Malaysia, um, the Malaysian Underwater Archaeology Department falls under the Jabatan Maritan Negara, the National Heritage Department. They have a dedicated department. Um, um, they've been working uh, very, very recently. Uh, I think earlier, no, just last week or two weeks ago, they found uh, some dynasty artifacts in the, in, while dredging the Pahang River in Pekan, uh, in Trenggano. Oh, in Pahang, sorry, in the east side of Malaysia. And then in uh, Trenggano, they've been working on uh, a shipwreck in Bidong Island. And uh, they should be doing phase two of the excavation next uh, year. In Thailand, um, Thailand is the underwater archaeology division in Thailand has been working very closely with the Navy. Uh, last year, the year before, they've been working on uh, the shipwreck in Manok Island, which is a 19th century steamship. Um, it has been actually been, been discovered a decade ago and it was one of the earliest sites for, for training for one of the Sparker trainings, uh, where they were reinvestigating the Manok Island shipwreck uh, last year. And for the upcoming year, they will be doing uh, intensive research on the Panong Syrian shipwreck, uh, which uh, Pook talked about uh, yesterday. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Philippines. Uh, in Philippines, uh, they, um, our friends uh, Bobby and Gay were excavating in uh, Marinduque, a place that has a special connection to me because my mom is Filipina and her hometown is Marinduque. Uh, they were excavating a site in Marinduque, and right now they are working on an exhibition in the National Museum in Marinduque, which will be out. Uh, later this year. So we hope to have something in Sparta featuring uh, the exhibition. And they also have an upcoming long-term collaboration with the Australian government for uh, working with underwater cultural heritage. Uh, and in Vietnam, uh, over the last year, we had, had surveys at the Bin Chau Bay um, uh, by the Underwater Archaeology Division, uh, the Underwater Research Division in the Institute of Archaeology. And the Vietnam Maritime Archaeological Project has been uh, working on projects in Haiphong and Quang Lan, uh, which was meant to be taken this year until COVID uh, threw everything off. And hopefully they will get back to the field next year or, or maybe the year after. So you can see that uh, around the region, there are many projects going on. Um, and they have been working with um, various forms of, of underwater heritage. Um, in the coming years, at least for the short term, um, the elephant in the room is of course COVID-19 budget cuts uh, is coming. I think everyone is expecting budget cuts for everybody. And that means uh, reduced fuel load capacity for everybody. Um, so I'm seeing uh, more and more from my colleagues that uh, we will have maybe, uh, everyone's just working on one project at a time or, or maybe just being best bound at the time being. Uh, like our colleagues in Artemis. Uh, many other countries are still unable to do systematic research on, research on their own. Uh, and, and that's because of that, that uh, three factors that we need to uh, put up in order for operations to start with. We need to develop uh, legal protections and adoption of the UNESCO Convention. Uh, I think legal legal protections on a national level are probably more important. And I think um, at different countries, there are different uh, different levels of legal protections for underwater cultural heritage um, that are in development and, and they vary from country to country. And, and that, those have to be addressed before we can even think about the UNESCO Convention. Public engagement is probably the most important things uh, that uh, countries should be doing. And uh, Indonesia does that the best. Uh, especially through uh, Zainab's agency, uh, because as we know, law enforcement and looting is still a, a big problem with um, 
uh, with underwater cultural heritage, we've seen the problem with um, uh, the looting of war graves uh, in, in Southeast Asian waters. And that is a, a, a blind spot that hopefully, I don't know whether Natalie can talk about this in, in her talk, um, but it, it's, that's a, a blind spot in, in, in our legislation. We do have uh, opportunistic locals and, and most of the looting that occurs happens on small scale looting. And uh, unfortunately in a time of recession like this, um, we will see more instances of uh, local salvage for sale because uh, that's an easy way to, to get good money. Uh, and that's where, that's where um, uh, public education efforts really uh, come to fruition. And that's my, and that's my, uh, my overview for, for the Southeast Asian region. Um, I, I think, you know, we have, um, we can see in, in the course of the last few decades, Southeast Asia has grown a lot in, in its capacity for underwater archaeology. And of course, we deal with many uh, challenges that are similar. Uh, funding is, is the, the biggest problem, but funding has always been a problem for archaeology. And so um, engaging the public and building trained personnel who can uh, be, as the military term goes, the, being a force multiplier, so that uh, a one really well-trained person to do the work of three people in the field, um, for example, and that's and that's something that we are looking to in in you know the mid to long term. Yes, so that's it. Thank you, Noel, for the presentation. Very enriching. Uh, you touch on many issues, including uh, COVID nineteen. I think we should have a more discussion on the impact of COVID nineteen, maybe in our Q and A session. But now I'll just move on to our last speaker, uh, really the last, almost last pre present presenter for the entire webinar, which is by Dr. Natalie Pearson. Um, Dr. Natalie is curriculum co coordinator at the Sydney Southeast Asia Center at the University of Sydney, where she is affiliated with the School of Literature, Art and Media. Her research focuses on the protection, management and interpretation of underwater cultural heritage in Southeast Asia. Natalie is co-editor of Perspectives on the Past at New Mandala and a regular contributor to the conversation. Natalie has a PhD on underwater cultural heritage in Indonesia and she has worked at the Asia Society's galleries in New York and Hong Kong and was as a consultant to the Asia Society Arts and Museum Summit. Her presentation will be on the capacity <coughs> building in a time of COVID-19 the case of the HMAS Perth. Natalie, over to you, please. Hi, hopefully you can all, all hear me. Hello from Sydney. It's very late here and very dark. Um, so let's get going. Um, I do have the special privilege of closing this session um, and indeed this symposium. And I had to laugh when I pointed out to Tunson Sen that he was the keynote, the first speaker and I was the last speaker and he replied by saying that we were like bookends. So I'm happy to be a bookend if Tansen is also a bookend. <laughs> it's been a great few days uh, and I'd also like to add a vote of thanks to the organizers, especially Kenny Ting, Stephen Murphy and all their staff for bringing everyone together, not only as speakers, but also online through the Zoom Q&A and uh, through the Facebook Live function. In this last session, we've been discussing the challenges and opportunities of capacity building in Asia. But of course, as we know, there is this added layer of complexity this year and for the foreseeable future due to COVID. And I loved how Tunson brought our attention to people and the movement of germs and diseases in his keynote. So what I wanna do in these precious final minutes is to offer up some reflections about capacity building in the time of COVID and the limitations we are all now facing in terms of our ability to travel, do international field work, meet with our collaborators, um, get funding, develop new networks, collect data, and indeed share our research and activities. So I'm gonna do this in relation to a project that I've been trying to get off the ground this year on HMAS Perth One, which was declared as Indonesia's very first marine protected zone in 2018. 
And I'll use this as a starting point for discussion about the future of heritage within the context of COVID. So let me start by sketching the story of HMAS Perth for you before turning to these bigger questions around capacity building in the time of COVID. HMAS Perth started life as HMS Amphion. She was built in the 1930s in Portsmouth, England by the Royal Navy and was later transferred to the Royal Australian Navy. During World War II, she was active all over the world. She underwent an extensive refit in Sydney in late 1941 and sailed for Java under Captain Heck Waller on the 14th of February, 1942. There she joined what was known as the ABDA force, ABDA standing for American, British, Dutch and Australian. She took part in the Battle of the Java Sea on the 27th and 28th of February, just north of Surabaya. Five Allied ships were lost in that battle and HMAS Perth was lucky to survive, along with USS Houston. She fled the Java Sea and headed west towards the Sunda Strait with USS Houston. They arrived at Tanjung Priok in Jakarta on the 28th of February, but received orders almost immediately to sail that night through the Sunda Strait and towards the south coast of Java. Basically, they had to get out of there. Shortly after departing Tanjung Priok, HMAS Perth received word of an enemy force in the area near Bunton Bay, and this was the Japanese Western Invasion Convoy. Perth and Houston stuck close to the Javanese coast to try and avoid detection, but they were spotted and an intense battle ensued. And this is what we call the Battle of the Sunda Strait. Both Perth and Houston were sunk by Japanese torpedoes, with Perth going down first just after midnight on the 1st of March and Houston shortly thereafter. At the time of her loss, HMAS Perth had a company of 681 men, and they were all men, including naval personnel, air force personnel, and some civilian staff. Of these, 353 died when Perth went down. Of the 1,061 men aboard USS Houston, 693 lives were lost. So between HMAS Perth and USS Houston, over 1,000 lives were lost. And most of the survivors were taken as prisoners of war. I also want to acknowledge at this point the losses experienced by the Japanese forces. What I want to do now is quickly walk you through the fate of HMAS Perth since 1942. Uh, so HMAS Perth sank in between 21 and 37 metres of water, coming to rest on her port side. She lay undisturbed in the Sunda Strait until the 1960s, when an Australian diver by the name of David Birchall set out to find her. He'd read some newspaper reports about so-called marine pirates in Southeast Asia who were salvaging World War II shipwrecks. And David Birchall was really keen to recover HMAS Perth's bell. It was seen by him as a touchstone object. And actually Perth had two bells. He did manage to find the wreck um, by speaking with local fishermen actually. And it was in pretty good condition as you can see from this image provided by the Australian National Maritime Museum. So some components are missing as shown in red and you can also see some evidence of torpedo damage in gray. David Birchall recovered some objects and took them back to Australia but he wasn't able to, to locate either of the bells. And we now know that these were salvaged in the late 60s, early 1970s. And they did make their way back to Australia eventually, but, but that's another story. Okay, skip forward now to 2009, when reports started to come in that Perth's bow section was starting to break away from the rest of the ship's hull. We can also see that there are a few more missing items by that stage, including some of the bridge structure and at least two of the propellers. By 2013, extensive illicit salvage had removed Perth's remaining superstructure. So that basically means the bits on top. And that included the catapult, the bridge, the crane, and parts of the forward six inch gun turrets. Over the next few years, Perth's entire stern section was removed, as was much of the hull plating on the starboard side. The two remaining six inch gun turrets, three of the ship's steam turbines, and all four boilers. 
So this is what it looked like in 2017, when Indonesian and Australian archaeologists conducted a joint survey of the wreck in May, in May 2017. They described the fate of HMAS Perth as death by a thousand cuts. And this was due to the decades of salvaging that's taken place on this wreck. As you can see, there is less than 40% of the ship remaining. And let's not forget that this was the final resting place for over 300 men. This is a comparison of what Perth looked like when she was located in 1967 and what she looked like 50 years later. And I've seen in the, in the chat, um, a few people have been asking about this. The reasons this wreck and other World War II wrecks have been salvaged is for their scrap metal. The salvages started with targeted recovery of things like the bells, which were of high symbolic value, and the propellers, which were phosphor bronze and therefore had commercial value. And then over the years, they've moved on to this more indiscriminate industrial scale salvaging that we've seen. So the perpetrators of this recent industrial salvaging activity have not been uh, identified with, with confidence. Although media reports have suggested that this was part of a broader salvaging operation throughout Southeast Asia. And this has seen the removal of entire warships from the seabed including Dutch and British ships uh, that went down in the Battle of the Java Sea. Flag states, particularly the British and the Dutch governments, have been quite vocal in expressing their anger and disappointment with what has happened to these warships and those who went down with them, as have veterans groups, including in Australia and America. The fate of HMAS Perth and other naval vessels in Southeast Asia serves as a very powerful reminder of the need for states to work together cooperatively and proactively when it comes to protecting warships in foreign waters, particularly those with human remains. This is a complicated situation, both legally and practically. Even if marine protected zones were introduced at all these sites, there remains the question of enforcement and capacity. This problem is not unique to Southeast Asia. Places like the UK also experience these sort of challenges. Perhaps flag states were overly complacent about these wrecks and assumed that their depth would somehow protect them in a sense that they were somehow out of sight and out of mind. Or perhaps it was just too hard. The problem was too complex and therefore they just sort of parked it as something to worry about later. We could speculate endlessly as to why there has been a lack of effective, proactive action to manage wrecks such as HMAS Perth. But what I'm interested in is thinking about how we're going to work together now to manage HMAS Perth for the future. And this brings me to the Maritime Capacity Building Initiative. Just waiting for my slide to click through. There we go. So the Maritime Capacity Building Initiative um, is an initiative by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and it's managed by the Australian National Maritime Museum. It's aimed at the effective management of HMAS Perth. And the intention behind this initiative was to undertake another condition, uh, condition monitoring dive of the wreck. So in addition to that one in 2017, and to provide support to Indonesia for the development of a comprehensive management plan in recognition of the fact that Indonesia had declared this um, maritime protection zone around Perth in February 2018. So the project was funded from December 2018 and I was brought on board in February 2020, so this year, to run the second part of the project looking at the comprehensive management plan. It was supposed to be wrapped up by the middle of 2020 um, in June, but of course we all know what happened this year. So during the time of the project, the Australian National Maritime Museum did manage to complete a condition monitoring dive in May 2019, but the remainder of the project, which was about this comprehensive management plan, was really just put on hold. So in the last few months, we have been negotiating to have this funding extended and have been successful in doing so. But we have faced a number of challenges. I'm just waiting for my next slide. There we go. So with Travel Band, we have this issue of how to conduct a capacity building project when you can't actually travel to the places and meet with the people involved. 
And this is a significant issue with a project like this, which has multiple st stakeholders in Indonesia at the national as well as the provincial level, and including the coastal communities around Bunton Bay. And of course, we also need to keep in mind the Australian communities who care about this wreck as well. This inability to meet with communities and stakeholders has been the biggest hurdle for me because I approach capacity building from the perspective of learning and sharing together. So building trust, understanding priorities and concerns across a range of stakeholders and being very open to what I learn and hear along the way. Second, of course, the budget has been reduced. So the planned activities have changed and there is quite simply less money to work with. The third is the uncertainty around timing. Could we get the funding extended? When could we travel again? What com commitments can we actually make? Uh, and I heard earlier today that uh, worst case scenario, potentially no travel until 2024. So that really puts it in perspective. And of course, the changes have impacted on the Australian team that I'd put together, who were busy preparing the visa applications for Indonesia when COVID hit and have had to change their plans and their expectations significantly in terms of what they've been asked to do. These challenges had consequences for the project. We've had to demonstrate that the project is still feasible and that it can be adapted within the context of COVID. We've developed methodological alternatives. So instead of going to Indonesia, I'm engaging local collaborators to do some of the preliminary community consultations and discussions. And it's worth making the point that this actually serves the capacity building objectives better. So in my view, the project is stronger for being forced to embrace these methodological alternatives. Another consequence has been a greater reliance on existing networks. I have colleagues like Zainab, who we heard from earlier, who I can work closely with and with whom there is already a relationship of trust. This is a great reminder of the importance of investing in these sort of relationships prior to any project. These relationships don't come about because of capacity building projects. It's the opposite. Capacity building projects come about because of these relationships. As I've mentioned, there are fewer opportunities for the Australian team to work with local communities, but that's also opened up possibilities for the Indonesian team. And of course, there are ethical considerations associated with using local interlocutors from a health perspective. And there's also the challenge of bureaucracy. This is something we really need to get better at in terms of facilitating payments from Australia to Indonesia to local staff and making sure that we can provide good support and training. And finally, although there are limitations of the online pivot, there are also lots of opportunities. It's much more socially acceptable to have a quick Zoom meeting than it's ever been. And more and more content is being made available online, like this symposium. I want to wrap up by asking what heritage might look like post COVID. COVID has forced us to face the problems of extractive research. We are relying on local partnerships more than ever, and we have to recognize the shared responsibility in research partnerships. It prompts the question of why we haven't been doing this all along. And how can we embed this as part of collaborative research practices in the future? Given the healthcare and economic and political crises we are seeing across the world, I think we need to be aware of why we are choosing to attend to heritage and to archaeology, as we have been doing in this symposium. We need to have a keen sense of why heritage matters at a time when there are so many competing priorities. This isn't about dusty objects hidden in museums or rusting relics at the bottom of the sea or ancient maritime connections. This is about how the echoes of the past continue to resonate today. We saw examples of this earlier in the year with, this, with the dismantling of Confederate and other pro-slavery statues as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Heritage is nothing less than a flashpoint for the biggest issues of our time. And what a powerful example we have of that with the echoes of the Maritime Silk Road in the Belt and Road Initiative. Heritage is where these debates about identity, inequality, privilege, opportunity, modernity, colonialism, national ambition, come together, where the ideas and the legacies of the past intersect with the present and create friction and opportunity. 
Finally, COVID has made us confront the value we place on the materiality of heritage because it has essentially prevented us from experiencing sight and object in a physical sense. It reminds me of the observation by Australian heritage scholar, Laura Jane Smith, that all heritage is intangible, that heritage is a process of cultural production. The implication is that we all have a say in how it's produced and that we can continue to make meaning with and from heritage, even when this heritage is being destroyed, even when we are unable to save it, even when we are unable to visit it, dive it, commemorate it. To bring this back to HMAS Perth, one of the ideas we are exploring at the moment is the development of an online portal that can be accessed anywhere by anyone, that tells HMAS Perth's history as a ship of the Royal Navy, of its transfer to the Australian Navy, of its peacetime and wartime experiences, and of its crew, crew and their families. And also the story of the wreck post-1942 as part of an Indonesian context, as a presence in Bunton Bay, and from the perspective of these coastal communities. As I've outlined, HMAS Perth is a significant shipwreck for both Australia and Indonesia, and there is strong interest from both sides in working together to ensure that we can do justice to its communities and continue to tell its stories for the future. What that storytelling looks like is a big question, and will be informed by these considerations of heritage in a post-COVID world. What COVID has done in a way is to force us to think more creatively and more expansively about heritage and perhaps push us in a direction where conservation and preservation of heritage sites such as HMAS Perth also sit alongside broader considerations about how we use heritage to make sense of the present and about how we can continue to make these stories relevant for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, for the presentation. I think you covered many different issues, including um, cross-boundary collaborations, ethical issues of human remains, as well as bring us to the biggest issue of um, our time, COVID-19. I think that sets us up for quite an interesting debate and discussion in the Q&A session. But before we go to the Q&A, maybe I'll uh, return the time to Lester to share with us a bit of the house rules and admin instructions. Lester. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yo Kuxiang, our panel chair. And uh, once again, a big thank you to all our speakers. Uh, wonderful sharing there. Uh, I saw a lot of discussion going on in the Q&A segment. Uh, a lot of you have vested interest as well. So please keep them coming in. Uh, a note to our speakers as well, you, uh, if they are directed to you. In the meantime, please feel free to reply to them. Uh, a lot of them are asking for your contacts as well. If you wish, you can uh, reply to them as well. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, those of you, if you are tuning in for the first time, which I hope not because uh, such a wonderful three-day symposium. Now, once again, click on the Q&A icon, either on the bottom or the top of your screen. You can submit your questions. If you have a particular speaker that you'd like to submit your question to, uh, please state their name. Now, please remember to introduce yourself and the organization that you are from as well. If you have a general question, you can just say to all and you ask your question. All right, so uh, thank you very much. Without further ado, uh, back to our panel chair, Mr. Yo Kirk Siang, please. Thank you, Lester. Uh, as I mentioned, I think um, the last presentation touched on the greatest challenge of our time, COVID-19. And I think maybe to start off the discussion, we'll, we can focus a bit on that because a few of the speakers have, in one way or another, in their presentations, touched on this, this topic. And, and I think the impact is really deep. I think as we look at governments um, trying to tackle uh, the pandemic issues and the economic impact of COVID-19, a lot of the financial um, resources have been devoted into looking at the healthcare system, uh, cushioning the economic impact um, associated uh, arising from the pandemic. And of course, the speakers also mentioned um, different challenges that the pandemic has posed, travel restrictions uh, that's hindering our um, collaboration and exchange of expertise across countries, movement restrictions that could hinder a uh, few work. And, and, and I think there was also talk about, I think Noel mentioned about, you know, with the recession and the economic crisis that many countries face, um, that could result in increased looting by various communities given the economic challenges. Um, but are there aspects that we can be more positive about I think this webinar is one example 
where we are able to harness the, the technology uh, to bring people from and experts from all around the world together to have this kind of debate, which would not be possible in, in a physical uh, space alone if we uh, didn't use these tools. Um, so maybe my first question to, to the speakers in general, and anyone can answer this, is how do you think the impact um, you know, COVID-19 poses to the uh, archaeology field? What would the post-COVID um, future look like for, for, for our discipline? Uh, and are you an optimist or a pessimistic uh, in your outlook on, on the situation at hand? So maybe I can invite any of the uh, panelists to, to share their views on the situation and the impact. Okay, I'll bite. Um, I think um, the immediate impact for COVID for many of my colleagues, including myself uh, in archaeology, is that uh, a lot of us now have time to be writing all the reports that we're meant to be writing. So actually, I think um, at least for the, for the next year or two, um, I feel that many of my colleagues will, will be uh, busy writing, which is not a bad thing. I think um, uh, for many of my colleagues who work in the field, uh, there's a lot of time spent in the field, but not enough time spent um, processing the data and writing. And so I, I find that uh, many people are forced to be indoors and forced to be working on their data and forced to be writing their reports. And I think that is uh, actually a good thing for, for the short term. Um, in the, in the, and then the other, the other thing is also because of um, the financial impact of this uh, crisis, uh, what we do see and what we all are anticipating is that uh, everyone's budget is going to get slashed. Everyone's going to be working with less budgets for the, for the next couple of years. Uh, and so one might not be able to conduct that many field, uh, uh, field operations to begin with. So that, that um, it is a, probably a time for consolidation for, for a lot of us. Natalie, you, in your presentation, I think you highlighted a few, few of the challenges. Do you have anything to add to you know, your, your thoughts on the future? Look, I think it's easy to be pessimistic and I confess that sometimes I succumb to that myself, but uh, it's important to, to stay focused on what, what is possible. Uh, and Noel's made a great point there about this being an opportunity to write up all those field notes you never quite finished writing up, um, to revisit the data and the archives that you've got, and also to really uh, invest in collaborative partnerships um, internationally and think about how we can put in place relationships and practices that ensure that those um, local partnerships continue even post-COVID. So, I mean, I think it's important to focus on the opportunities that that COVID is presenting, even as we recognise the, you know, the devastating impact that it's having on, on livelihoods, um, on people's health, on the economy. Um, it's important not to succumb to despair and to focus on what we can do. Thanks, Natalie. And anyone else want to share your thoughts on this, this topic? Yeah, maybe, I guess it's always there's two ends of the spectrum, right? Two sides of the coin. It might be the same coin, but it's always two sides. Uh, as a, for, I guess, for construction has stopped. So in that sense, uh, a lot of archaeological sites, a lot of archaeological reservoirs, in that sense, it's uh, given a reprieve, right? There's a break from we don't need to conduct all these excavations or rescue excavations to save them. So that's, that's a plus side. Uh, on the other side, there's also um, the, the the bit on illicit trade, right? I, I've been getting uh, anecdotal uh, comments and 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 feedback from my colleagues around the region that you know looting it's it's is of our sites have been on the rise because why you know people are poor they need to sell something, right? So so you have people that there's a, and people are not being uh, sites are not being protected or police because you know, things are locked down. So that's that, that, that opportunity of destruction as well. So on one, on one hand, uh, organized destruction is placed on hold. So that's good for archaeology. Oh. And on the other hand, uh, 
uh, illicit or uh, the underground destruction, it's, 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 it's a bit more rampant, I suspect. Anyone else would like to add on to the thoughts? Mr. Yu? Yes, let me ah. sign up, yes. Um, in time of COVID, um, yeah, as I mentioned by Dr. Chan, Dr. Lin, that um, it will be two sides, a positive and um, uh, the plus and um, the, the negative. And then uh, for us, for for our experiences that uh, as we miniature museums, more museum in the um, uh, at the ministries, it it brings us the idea to um, it gives us the idea to bring the, the collections online, or to do to do the event to bring the event online. That used to be we invite the school the the school the school children to come and and. But then it uh, could force us to do to conduct it online, and so uh, thanks to the internet connections anyway, and bring us so bring us spaceless, um, spa uh, placeless to this, and and also we found the as said also Natalie, I agree with the, with Natalie that collaborate collaborative um, we need for to to strengthen the collaboration um, we experience we need for 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 my unit we need to conduct survey and this is um, um we need to conduct survey in a quiet uh, in a quiet far island uh, but at the end we couldn't we we couldn't travel far away from jakarta uh, and therefore, we involve the local, the local government to assist us to do the survey, something like this. And and this is a positive. The positive part is um, um, we 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 strengthen the collaboration uh, more than before, more than before. The, um, but but if we can't say there is no. Uh, under some circumstances, um, face to face, or facing or meeting the community, uh, discussing the community, that couldn't be replaced by uh, through online or something. That, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Zainab. Um, Dr. Shin, um, from your perspective, do you, has the COVID nineteen affected the your center's work, your colleagues' work in in China? Would you be able to share some thoughts on the future? Uh,大家好。啊,其实我非常同意以上几位演讲者提出的问题。首先呢,我们考古工作面临的就是我们呃项目减少。调查的和发掘的项目都在减少然后这样呢其实是对于控制疫情来讲是非常非常不利的所以我们自己本身也很担心这个问题呃这个项目减少的话呢其实呃如果对于控制疫情有好处的话其实我们更多的想去关心个人的健康这个是要放在首位的个人
我们在一起合作，呃，进行培训呢，然后就形成了非常好的呃这种互动。良好的这种朋友的关系，然后这次培训呢，其实给我的触动是很大的。然后我觉得这种方式非常好，就是有机会呢，让不同国家的人、不同国家的呃考古学家呢聚集在一起，然后大家共同做一个培训，然后呢能够加深我们之间的交流。就将来有希望的话呢，我们就就可以就是这种做更深入的交流或者更深入的这种项目上的合作是非常非常有利的。然后那个。就是一七到一八年，然后本来呢，我们是想，呃，今年就是二零二零年的时候呢，同样再举办一次“一带一路”水下考古培训班，呃，但是呢，就是因为受这个疫情的影响，我们这个计划就被迫取消了，或者是至少这个计划要延迟举行。呃，实际上我们在二零一九年的时候呢，已经给好多国家都发出了邀请，呃，就希望其他国家呢，如果有这个。呃，愿望的话就可以那个，就是我们可以提供一些帮助，然后帮大家呃培训一些那个培培训那个水下考古队员，呃，而且呢，就是我们经费上面呢，就是可以也是有有有一点点帮助，呃，收收到的那个反馈是很好的，呃，但是说就是因为疫情的影响呢，然后我们这个也举办不了了，这个事情其实是非常遗憾的，就是希望将来呢我们。能够继续把这个项目能够继续办下去，然后呢，就是和更多的国家呢，呃，建立良好的这种互动关系。Thank you, Dr. Sin, for for your sharing. Um, maybe I will take a question from from the question um the the Q and A because zooming in on another major crisis, someone um Lily Chong. As a question for all the our panelists, does climate crisis, um, and especially the rising sea level, um, factor in your work now or in future plans? Do you worry about it, and if so, in what way? Climate crisis and the issue of rising sea levels. Anyone want to have a go at this question? Um, I can start. I think uh, if we're not paying attention to climate change when we're researching underwater cultural heritage or thinking about how to tell these stories for future generations, um, you know, we really, we really should be. Uh, what's happening in our oceans uh, is, is destroying the heritage. It's destroying um, the marine ecosystems. We're seeing acidification of, of the ocean. We're seeing rising sea levels. It's, it's not just the rising sea levels. There's a whole lot of issues going on. Uh, we're seeing more and more disasters. For example, the, the tsunami in Indonesia near Bantan Bay a few years ago is believed to have affected HMAS Perth. So all of these things affect heritage. Um, and I think other underwater archaeologists can um, probably share more about their research on how, uh, you know, what studying this heritage can tell us about changes to the climate over many millennia, um, particularly in an Australian context, for example. So, yeah, look, COVID is the, the problem of our time um, at the moment in the short term, but of course, the one that we all need to be thinking about is climate change. Thank you, Natalie. Anyone else would like to add on to their, their thoughts on this issue of climate change? Okay, if not, maybe um, another question, I think also, uh, um, but this time more of the geopolitical issues. I think um, someone asked about political tensions. If I can maybe generalize and broaden the issue a bit, I guess, if we're looking at the geopolitical issues, I think a lot of countries are, uh, I think, you know, facing uh, more international tensions and, and even uh, more more inward looking in, in some sense. Um, and I think in our earlier presentations, we do talk about the importance of uh, international collaborations, which are necessary to create um, uh, this kind of expertise. So in, in, in this kind of uh, increasing climate of tension, uh, geopolitical issues, um, maybe how can we not let's not look at maybe the what the question say about re reducing tensions. I think that's for a, 
a much broader issue, but how do we as uh, professionals in our field work around some of these issues and continue to, to grow um, you know, and have these kind of collaborative models? Any thoughts uh, of how do we increase uh, our collaborations despite some of these growing issues um, globally? I think maybe Noel, you want to, would you have some thoughts? I think you work in um, uh, a field where you do have interactions with a lot of different countries and uh, yeah, that's something maybe an uh, issue that maybe you could share a bit more. So I'll start with a story. Uh, I was with uh, uh, a Sparta event, it's not an underwater archaeology event, but we were in the mountains somewhere. Um, and we were all having a drink, as archaeologists tend to do. And then the Burmese guy goes to the Thai guy and he goes, even though we were at war 500 years ago, we are friends! And they're drinking out. And then the Cambodian guy goes to the Thai guy and then he goes, even though we were at war 500 years ago, now we are friends! And then we drink. So I, I feel that that kind of relationship encapsulates um, uh, the archaeological community here. Uh, I think everyone's friends. Uh, and everyone, uh, even, with, even with underwater archaeology, the community is so small that you could name everybody. Uh, it's, it's uh, you, you, you already call it the usual suspects. Uh, everyone's, everyone's very willing to share with each other. Everyone's willing to work with each other and everyone's willing to collaborate with each other and they do so in a, a fairly uh, regular basis. Uh, so I, I, I do feel like on the, on the ground level there's a, a very good level of collegiality amongst all our colleagues. Um, I, think, I think it gets more tricky when it comes to um, uh, territorial sovereignty or when it comes to issues of um, whose shipwreck it belongs to. And, and I don't think we've ever had um, those kinds of issues um, surface, but it's always that, there's always that potential. So I, and I, I think that our governments, that our people tend to be non-confrontational that way too. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the short answer is that, um, no, I think, I think everyone is, is, uh, the community is better when everyone works together. And I think the community would like to see us working that way. Thanks, Noel. I like your example where people get together over drinks. Somehow things get done. <laughs> Thanks. Natalie, you got any perspective to share? Uh, I don't want to be hogging all the um, answers, but um, yeah, uh, nice, nice comment there, Noel, about um, collaboration over alcohol. I think that's a common theme for many archaeologists. Um, and I, I suspect a few are having a glass of wine as they're watching this symposium. Um, I just wanted to make a, a comment about collaboration and Noel, you just touched on, um, you said no, none of these sort of difficult issues have come to the surface. Uh, you know, I think HMAS Perth is actually a good example of um, a, a heritage site where there could have been a lot more collaboration a lot earlier. So that shipwreck has been there since 1942, that's over 75 years. And um, we've known about the location of it and um, that there are human remains there since 1967, we know where it is. Um, but it, it took until 2013 with these photos coming out of the salvage barges with the big claw um, before, you know, flag state started to pay attention again um, and you know we can talk about neglect and enforcement and try and apportion blame and responsibility here um, but that's a really that's a really difficult and sensitive and complicated topic because HMAS Perth was you know she was in Java defending Dutch interests not Indonesian interests so um, you know as I said I we could go round and round on that, but I think it's important to focus on the collaboration um, going forward in terms of what is possible. Um, and the other comment I wanted to make is, it 
to support this sort of collaboration, it's really important to have people who, who work, have deep experience in the area. You know, if you have language skills in the country that you work in, um, if you've spent, you know, 20 years working in a country and you've developed connections and an understanding of how things work there, of, of the historical context, all of this is so important in strengthening collaborations. Thanks, Natalie. I, I think um, I, I was just looking at the Q&A. I think there's, um, there's a question about the um, issue of, um, I guess, looting. I think we, we briefly touched on it. And I think this is one issue that has been brought up in many of the Q&As. I think uh, Ian from McCain from the University of New England mentions that uh, you know, we're not addressing larger issues of destruction of underwater cultural heritage through fishing practices and looting. The contraction in the economies, there will be less money to tackle these issues. Uh, the acceleration in the illegal export of artifacts in recent months with little restriction on these activities. Uh, I, I wonder if anyone has any views on how some of these issues uh, surrounding uh, legal looting could be tackled uh, in a more effective way, uh, especially with the given uh, the current crisis. I, I think this is an issue that's been uh, on the minds of many of our participants and maybe you'd like to invite some of the speakers to share their thoughts on this issue as well. Anyone? Mr. Yu? Is Zaina? Uh, yes. Um, lootings. And in my perspective, um, when it comes up with the lootings, uh, law enforcement, uh, law enforcement uh, should be on the first priority. Uh, set aside that whether uh, how the how, how how effective this law enforcement is but but the, the, it is this is the this is the tools this is the tools that we can um uh, that the government created and and the second one is the collaboration between countries is important to build the monitoring network for this. It is uh, it's quite hard when one country, um, uh, it is quite hard to monitor, the, the, uh, to trace the, the, um, from one country that, the, um, that face the, the, the illegal salvage, the lootings, and then uh, the, the, the artifacts brought to the other countries or the demand from the other countries um, uh, are high and then and it is impacted the other countries. So um, collaboration between countries that involve in this uh, to bring the, 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 the network, the monitoring network would be um, very significant to build in it. And and also um, the community monitoring, but it will be in for it. It, uh, it requires it requires the, the the awareness. If we want to involve the community, it requires awareness to to um, to to. And we need to ensure them this is important for them. Not only in material, but also material for us in Southeast Asia, particularly for Indonesian case, that when we, we, when we, build, when we, when we brought, bring the issues uh, onto the table for them, that we need to protect this side because this is, this is important. They will, be, they will be back to us. What is important for us? This is important for you because you are aware of the importance of this. But for us, what is the benefit? So uh, uh, collaboration and also capacity building uh, in all level, in all level, start from the uh, communities and until the, uh, the top level of the uh, uh, policy maker that requires that. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else to add on the issue of salvage and looting?
at the risk of talking too much, uh, just a brief comment. I, I do think that um, the issue of looting in, in looting artifacts um, for sale is really more of an economic issue rather than it is a, 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 an archaeological issue. And I, I feel like when archaeologists are, are called to to say something about looting, it's it's already like um, trying to close the, the doors when the, the horse is bolted. Uh, and, and which is why it's very important for uh, initiatives like uh, Zainab, uh, um, Zainab's agency where, where she's engaging the policymakers, the governments, the, the local people. Uh, and we've seen a very good uh, response on uh, land looting in Cambodia where we teach school children how to value these artifacts uh, so that when they get found from the ground, they get reported to the museum immediately. Uh, and and that, that sort of groundwork has to start uh, not now. We shouldn't be thinking of them now when we're in an economic crisis. We should be doing them in the good times. Uh, yeah. And so now, now is probably the, the time where we have to be looking more closely at enforcement. But once that's over, we have to start looking at education. Thanks, Noel. I think on the topic of creating economic benefits to people, I think there was a question about more in general about, I think some, if I remember, I can't see the question, but I think it was talking about, you know, how do we create uh, maybe like underwater heritage, um, tourism, um, we in Singapore, but if I can broaden it, not just to Singapore, but around the countries, I think, um, would, do you think that's a feasible, I think in our presentation by Ms. Zainab, uh, she does mention about tourism benefits. Would that be um, something that we should be doing more of? You know, growing tourism um, for underwater cultural heritage as a way to benefit, I think, local, to change their economics behind some of these challenges that we're talking about. Does anyone have any views on, um, or, or other examples of uh, underwater tourism uh, that can benefit um, the work in this field? Or maybe if I can pose the question in a different way, I think maybe to Ms. Zainab, if you can perhaps share how, how does the, how has the project, I think, um, you know, Benefit. has it benefited the livelihoods or the, the economics um, of the people, the local communities? Uh, if you can share more details in addition to what you have mentioned in your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you. Actually, uh, I would like to mention that I would like to mention the 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 quantity the the, the quantitative um, data, but uh, about how the how the um, how this tourism local based tourism benefit them um, and increase their in, increase their income. But what I can say now is um, uh, there is a the the parameter the, the parametric that I can't say is um, there is a visitors from um, from no visitors to some visitors and from um, one small uh, business to some to more than one uh, small businesses to cater the visitor so this is the indicators that. This is the, the indicators that I uh, we can say the tourism, the local tourism uh, development benefit to the community, and um, and what uh, what I what I still I, I still find the, the answer anyway. Uh, we are find we are going to find the answer. This is the evaluation for the program itself. That whether this um, this these activities the economic benefit. Uh, bring the uh, bring along the, the the awareness to the heritage. If the if they found this uh, this heritage can be uh, beneficial for them, will 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 they involve to will they involve in the uh, to manage to protect, or will will uh, will it be prevent them to salvage or to sell the artifacts that used. Um, 
prevent them to do the activities they, they used to be. So the, the, um, I'm willing to find them. We will continue the the uh, the research on it as our the evaluation for the uh, for for the program. But yes, the tourism benefits. Or I can say the indicators that visitors, no visitors, and there is visit. They are visitors and a small. Uh, there is no business um, before and small business um, uh, come up. There is a scale up and no and we. Um, there is no stakeholders before, and then another stakeholders involved in the in the program. Thank you, Ms. Zainab. I think in the in one of the comments by one of our participants, uh, Ms. Sarah Ward, she did mention that there are plenty of examples of UK underwater uh, heritage as well as in other countries in Europe, like Croatia and Greece. So maybe these are useful examples and alternatives of how we can harness uh, underwater cultural heritage for some of these um, future aspects. Um, maybe I turn, the, there was a question if I can find to, to Dr. Xin Guang Chan uh, from a participant, um, Mr. Kenneth. Uh, he would like to ask about, you know, would you be able to share more information about any ongoing work on submerged cities? Uh, and what new historical and cultural perspectives are being explored in these projects? Uh, Dr. Sin, please. Uh, oh, I want to ask the question that the speaker asked earlier. It's about the fact that the government has a lot of experience in the world. Now, the government has a lot of 就是呃，我不知道大家是不是清楚，我们中国国内呢有比较完备的文物保护法，然后呢，现在呢我们也正在做一个水下文化遗产保护条例的修订工作。呃，但是大家知道呢，这个法律是一个层面，真正实施起来呢，这个现实生现实中呢，我们肯定会面临到很多困难。呃，在实际我们实施水下考古项目的时候呢，我们会建立这种。呃，跨部门的这种协调小组，就是由我们文物部门牵头吧，然后再加上海海警、海监、海事，就等等管理这种海洋的这种部门，然后我们一起来做这个工作。嗯，这个呢，就实实实际上，如果碰到真正的有这种盗捞啊这种问题的话呢，它是可以有有这种可以出动警力，就是有执法权利的这些部门。是可以帮我们解决这些问题的，嗯、呃，当然这是针对一些比较大型的项目而言啊，呃，我我们那个，呃，对于要不要说以旅游的开放旅游的方式，然后来拉动经济，然后甚至说那个减少这种盗捞的问题，提呃提高当地社群的收入啊，这个应该不是我们目前的呃这种。呃，一个思一个思路，我我们呢主要采取的呢还是保护第一，然后再考虑向公众开放，让公众也参与进来。所以，我们呃，我们中国来讲呢，就是不会只考虑到经济效益，我们还是要把这个保护，呃，原址保护放在首位的。呃，比方说我们文物保护法呢就有规定，国家对文物保护呢是实行。保护为主，抢救第一，合理利用，加强管理的这个十六字的工作方针，我们的实际工作呢也是依照这个方针的指导来进行的。呃，你比方我在演讲里面提到的这种呃军州军州城啊，然后那个西桥山呐、啊，他们都是一个非常好的呃，就是对于潜水爱好者来说，都是一个非常好的这种潜点。但是实际上呢，我们都要考虑要先要把这个遗址保护起来，然后其次我们才向公众做一个开放。呃、好了，这是我对之前问题的一个回复。呃，另另外那个就是主持人刚才问的是，我们还有没有其他的项目做分享？是吗？是说是问我们那个现在。呃，正在进行的有什么水下考古项目吗、yes, yeah, ？Yes, I think yeah, there was the question. I think mainly about 
underwater, uh, submerged cities, I think. Yeah. Whether there were any examples to share, but I think it's, it's I think Dr. Singh has really shared quite a fair amount of details. So I think thank, thanks Dr. Sin for, for the elaboration. I'm, I'm mindful of the time and I, uh, we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry we won't be able to address all of them. But I think let's just take one last question which also was posed very early uh, in our panel discussion. Um, there was a question for discussion. I think not only uh, Singapore uh, archaeology projects happen by accident, um, could there be a way forward to encourage uh, particularly governments to take a more research-based investigation of our archaeological heritage? Is this approach too ambitious in our region? Um, I think this was posed uh, especially to, to Chen, I think, uh, during Chen's uh, presentation about, but he, was, he has widened it to, to, to sort of in general whether you know, this reactionary approach to archaeology, can there be a different approach, a research-based approach to it? Any thoughts from anyone? Uh, sure, since uh, maybe I'll get the ball rolling for this. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a universal problem. It's, it's worldwide. Archaeologists face this thing, you know, face uh, uh, accidental discovery because of, well, be it construction development uh, or farming or looting. So, or salvaging or, or, or people trying to get scrap metal. So this happens everywhere in the world. And I, I don't know, maybe like I said in the presentation, I'm hopelessly naive and uh, hopelessly optimistic in that sense that uh, it might be a good thing for archaeology in that sense that, you know, it spurs us in action, even for, for uh, although we lament that the HMAS Perth has been destroyed by these salvages, but it forced us, uh, forced archaeologists or forced resources being come in at, at a certain time that we're at least trying to do something about it. Of course, we could have done something in 1945 or 1955 or 1965, but you know, there's, there's only so much resources that we have. Uh, uh, Noah, Noah mentioned a great thing about this, this uh, virus is like, you know, we are forced to sit down and, and, and write and produce a reports which are many years backlogged, right? So we are overwhelmed with lots of uh, materials. We're overwhelmed with lots of sites. We're overwhelmed with, with threats from the development, from looting, from everything. So is it a bad thing? Uh, how do, we, how do we encourage uh, government or, or, or people to come forward? Uh, that this is the, this is the uh, uh, billion dollar question, right? So how do we get more funding? Uh, this is something I think is universal. All my colleagues on this panel will have said that, yes, we may have regulations, we may have uh, legislation, we may have policemen helping us, we have local community helping us, but we still need resources. And how long can these resources last? And I bet all my, my colleagues in the same panel is like, even though we may work for state agencies, we may work for a museum or private organizations or, 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 or uh, universities or research institutes, but funding is it's, it's not permanent, right? There's, there's, there's these issues. And with a greater uh, threat to world economy, people's livelihood, uh, chances are pe people like uh, us archaeologists and, and the heritage industries are, are really way down in a totem pole. So when you need to eliminate safe on the budget and things, what goes first? So these, these, are, these are issues we face worldwide. Uh, I won't have answers for them. Of course, it's great too, that we, we can persuade uh, the state agencies uh, to, to assist, but even state agencies are limited with the amount of pool of resources and funding that they have. I don't have answers for that. Uh, well, we only can hope that, uh, for example, like the National Heritage Board uh, sponsoring this event, they will continue over the next few years to sponsor this event. Uh, organizing organizations like SPAFA, perhaps, yes, they might want to flex their regional powers and start helping all the allies and colleagues in Southeast Asia. So perhaps we can band together and keep lobbying these people, right? So those of you out there, if you have uh, questions for us as archaeologists uh, or, or historians, uh, our hands are a little bit tight. Maybe it's time for you to go see your member of parliament, go out there and start writing emails and letters to your, to your elected members and uh, persuade them to give us more resources and funding. Thank you, Chen. Does anyone have any other thoughts to add to this issue? If not, I'll... I'll bring the session to a close and I apologize to the participants that we 
we can't answer all the questions. There's a lot of questions that were posed. I think it was a very active uh, involvement of the panelists and the participants. I think we covered a lot of issues from you know, livelihood, sustainable development, the economics of it. Um, you know, uh, even COVID, I think 19 was covered in our, our, our discussion. So a very rich um, discussion. I'd like to thank um, the panelists for the excellent sharing uh, on a diverse range of issues uh, covered in the last presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand the time back to um, Lester to, to conclude the session. Thank you very much to our panel chair, Mr. Yo. A big thank you to all our panelists as well. So we're going to bring all of you on screen for a group photo. All right, so I'm just going to turn off my camera first. All right, so I'd like all of you to please kindly smile. Just look into the camera, smile for your first formal, formal photo shot. We're going to take the photo from our end, do a screenshot. Okay, great. A second photo. Thumbs up, everybody. Thumbs up. All right, thank you very much. Thumbs up. All right, thumbs up. Thank you. We're going to take a screenshot. Thank you very, very much, everyone. All right, so once again, uh, well, sincere appreciation to our panel chair, Mr. Yo Kuk Siang. A big thank you to our panelists as well, Mr. Lim, Ms. Zainab, Dr. Sin, Dr. Tan, as well as Dr. Pearson. Thank you very much for all your time and your wonderful expertise in sharing with all our audience. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at the end of this wonderful event, Three Day Symposium. Uh, so, really here to wrap things up for all of us. Uh, I'd like to now invite back, uh, as you know, they were here to welcome all of you to our symposium. So it's only fitting that we welcome them to really just wrap up our three-day China and the Maritime Silk Road Symposium. So I'd like to invite Mr. Kenny Ting, Director of Asian Civilizations Museum and Peranakan Museum, Group Director of Museums from the National Heritage Board Singapore, together with Dr. Stephen Murphy, Senior Curator for Southeast Asia at the Asian Civilizations Museum for the closing remarks. So I'd like first to hand the time over to Dr. Murphy, please. Uh, thank you, Lester. And uh, thanks everybody for sticking with us uh, to the end. It's really great to see that most of the, the people that tuned in tonight are still here. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a marathon, uh, so uh, yeah. Very much appreciated. Um, yeah, so first off, really on that note, I'd just like to thank uh, all of you, especially the presenters and the audience for taking part uh, in what I can only term as a grand online experiment. Um, this is the first time that I or ACM have attempted a symposium of this scale in a webinar format. Um, so it's been a steep learning curve uh, for us, as well as I'd, I'd imagine uh, for many of you too. Uh, thank you for bearing with us through the technical glitches, the multiple emails and Zoom links, and of course, the complicated and sometimes consume, uh, confusing time zone shifts. I think I can safely say that this is the first time I've ever seen a keynote given at 7 a.m. from a kitchen table in New York. A Zoom presentation from China routed through Skype using a VPN, um, as well as a talk given from a tent during a glamping trip, and in our recent, uh, in, our, in this panel here, a very auspicious call to prayer in the background. Um, so once again, uh, thank you all for being part of this. Uh, in terms of the topics covered and the presentations giving, given, I think that whether we use the term, the Maritime Silk Road, Indian Ocean World, Tansen Sen's idea of floating cosmopolitanism, or uh, cosmopolitisms in plural, uh, or any number of other terms that have come up over the course of this weekend, uh, what this sy symposium has really revealed is the sheer scope and the breadth of the maritime world, be that historically, geographically, culturally, or in terms of the vast diversity of experiences, commodities, peoples, places that it encompasses. The papers have illuminated stories, ideas, religions, material cultures, shipwrecks and ports that stretch from the east coast of Africa all the way to the west coast of the Americas and everywhere in between. Uh, this has inspired me at least to look anew at many topics covered by our speakers. The first panel really brought home to me the level of connectivity that existed by the 7th to 8th century or even earlier. Uh, um, ports are vital nodes and in a sense liminal zones between the land and the sea. What also becomes apparent through the presentations is that their links to the inland networks are just as vital as those to the waves. 
The panel and shipwrecks allowed us to understand in greater depth how these connectivities were made and by whom. The exciting discoveries that have helped, that have been made over the past 20 to 30 years uh, are helping us to better understand seafaring and the life of the ocean. They are quite liter literally the vehicles for Tansen Sen's floating cosmopolitanism. The third panel emphasized further the cultural interaction, interchange and hybridity that can and does take place within this maritime world. I was struck by the variety and diversity of the evidence discussed. The final panel tonight uh, brings home to us all the challenges, but also the opportunities that exist for us as academics, researchers, heritage professionals, in regard to what I hope you will all agree is our shared maritime heritage. If we do not invest adequate time, money, and resources into this, uh, then we will not, not only lose important aspects of our history, but the many new stories that are surely waiting to be revealed. Um, on that note, I would like to second Professor John Mixick's call yesterday, and actually all of the sentiments and comments of the speakers tonight, um, to strengthen cooperation and collaboration across the region and amongst us all. I hope that in some small way that this symposium may have helped us move in that direction. Uh, so on, this, on that note, I'd like to thank you all once more for making this an extremely rewarding and thought provoking two and a half days. And I hope to see you all sometime soon, somewhere on that floating cosmopolis. Uh, with this, I hand over to Kenny Ting. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. And uh, thank you everyone once again. It's been such a pleasure and a very enriching experience attending uh, the symposium these three days. Uh, this symposium has been so critical as it has allowed us to dive deeper into subject areas and contemporary issues uh, that we are unable to present uh, with our physical displays and exhibitions at the museum. Uh, there are two key takeaways uh, for me. Uh, the first is that we cannot forget the people uh, who are part of uh, maritime trade. And uh, I don't just mean the elite and the merchants, uh, but the artisans, the shipwrights, the sailors, the monks, the entertainers, the slaves, men as well as women. Uh, the second sort of takeaway for me has been um, something I would describe as the sort of complexities and multiplicities of the history and heritage of maritime trade. Um, and that really for us to label all of this complexity, the Maritime Silk Road is limiting and even a little bit naive. Um, and so uh, at this point, I feel an overwhelming sense of curiosity and wonder uh, because I know that there's so much more to be uncovered, uh, so much more to be researched in the space of uh, maritime trade or however you want to call this subject. Um, I, I, I look forward to more uh, research, more uh, research partnerships, uh, COVID-19 not withstanding. And um, I don't know why we can't do this more regularly. Uh, we don't have to wait for an exhibition exchange or an exhibition to do a conference such as this. So as director of ACM, at least I would like to say that I definitely want uh, to do more uh, conferences that are related to the ACM's uh, collections and subject areas uh, in general. So, um, you know, uh, watch out uh, for this space uh, in, the, in, the, in the years to come. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers and moderators uh, for your expertise as well as for your passion. Uh, thank you again uh, for the wonderful discussion uh, during this symposium and for taking part in it despite uh, the uh, very, very time differences and very awkward uh, pre presentation times for some of you. Thank you to uh, the translators, uh, xie, 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 uh, who have also worked very hard uh, behind the scenes uh, to make sure everything can be understood. Uh, thanks uh, to Lester, our MC, and the team of, at Purple Forest uh, for the smooth running of the symposium. Uh, from ACM, big thanks to uh, Denise, who's worked super, super hard behind the scenes on the logistics and the procurement uh, to make this happen. Thanks to our research assistants, uh, Rie Ong and Tin Jin Tan, uh, for their invaluable help, again, getting this uh, up and going. Uh, and of course, a big thanks uh, to our own uh, Dr. Stephen Murphy uh, for putting uh, this uh, symposium together, uh, for sort of curating a sort of brilliant set of panels and, 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 and speakers, and for helming it uh, wonderfully uh, from start till end. Uh, finally, uh, a big thanks uh, to all of you, uh, the participants uh, who have been with us over uh, two and a half uh, days. Um, uh, I know that there's some feedback forms that you have to fill in, uh, which I'm sure uh, you'll be advised as to how to do. Um, if you are in Shanghai uh, from 15 September, please do uh, go by the Shanghai Museum uh, to see the Bali era treasures from the Tang Shipwreck Collection. 
if you're in Singapore, uh, come by ACM uh, to see the Chang Shipwreck and everything else we have for you here. And if you see me in the galleries, uh, please do uh, say hello. Uh, have a very good day and evening. And uh, now I hand it back to uh, Lester.